Hello, AP Biology students. Uh, this is our next chapter, uh, chapter 14, Biotechnology and Genomics. So I think when we were looking at genetics, uh, we did our study of genetics, we did study of cells, and we looked at molecular biology of a gene and learned about what those different fields do, genetics, uh, molecular biology, cell biology. I think this chapter is kind of pulls all that together and see to see how those separate fields can really benefit um, us and what we could do with uh, genetics, uh, molecular biology, cell cell biology um, today in industry, in uh, pharmaceuticals, um, in, in medicine, so all those areas. So this is, a, I think you'll find this this chapter pretty interesting. So there, there are uh, four sections in the chapter. You can see what they are uh, right there. Um, we will cover each one. Um, in the beginning, there is, uh, of the text, there's a little discussion on uh, tobacco plants for treatment. Uh, you don't necessarily need a copy of this particular slide, but if you go through and actually read that um, in your textbook, it's, it's an interesting article and it relates to what we we're going to learn about in this chapter. So let's start off with section 14.1, um, DNA cloning. Um, you should be able to describe the steps involved in making uh, recombinant DNA molecules, explain the purpose of the polymerase chain reaction, and identify how PCR or the polymerase chain reaction may be used to analyze DNA. So what do we know? Uh, cloning itself is the production of identical copies of DNA cells or organisms. Uh, what we see here is when <clears throat> um, members of a bacterial colony on a petri dish are clones uh, because they all came from the division of the same cell. Uh, we know that as binary fission. Um, identical twins are clones. A single embryo has separated uh, to become two. So, um, what is the purpose of, of cloning? Well, we do see a thing called gene cloning. Um, gene cloning is the production of many identical copies of the same gene. Uh, if it is inserted, if the uh, inserted gene is replicated and expressed, we can recover the clone gene or protein product. Um, clone genes have many research purposes. And basically, uh, what we do see there is if we take that gene and we then modify it and use it in a human um, for, for any purpose, uh, we could consider that gene therapy. Um, scientists clone genes for a number of reasons. Um, for example, they uh, might want to determine the difference in the base sequence between a normal gene or a mutated gene or they might want to use the genes to genetically modify organisms in a beneficial way. So uh, what we see there is um, when the organism then receives the gene, that clone gene, uh, that organism is called a transgenic organism. Transgenic, T-R-A-N-S-G-E-N-I-C. Um, transgenic organisms basically mean across or producing transgenic. So these organisms are frequently used to uh, produce a product that is desired by, by humans. So two processes that uh, scientists can use to clone DNA are recombinant DNA technology and the PCR, which is the polymerase chain reaction. Um, recombinant DNA contains DNA from two or more different sources. Uh, basically, what you have there is a vector. And if you look at the word vector, it means to carry. So a vector, it introduces the recombinant DNA into host cells. And what we see there are these things that we call plasmids. Now, you've heard me talk about these before, but plasms, plasmids 
are small accessory rings of DNA that are found in bacteria. Um, first discovered in the bacterium uh, Escherichia coli or E. coli, um, the ring is not part of the main bacterial chromosome, but it replicates on its own and can easily be removed from uh, one organism or introduced into a bacterial cell. So uh, that small accessory ring of DNA um, serves as a very common vector. Um, there are two enzymes that are required to introduce foreign DNA into vector DNA. Um, one of those is a restriction enzyme, and the restriction enzyme is going to cut or cleave um, that particular DNA molecule. And what you'll end up with are these things called sticky ends. Um, you'll see that soon. And then you have DNA ligase, and you know the role of DNA ligase all, uh, already. Um, DNA ligase, as in a comic strip, when DNA polymerase asks DNA ligase, hey, what are you doing there, DNA ligase? And DNA ligase says, oh, I'm just making ends meet. Um, because DNA ligase, the enzyme itself, seals the DNA into an opening created by the restriction enzyme. So if we look here, here are the steps of uh, um, cloning a human gene. Uh, the first thing you would do there is to actually get that plasmid vector and uh, the human DNA, and you'd use restriction enzymes to cleave the DNA together or, or to uh, separate them. Um, the restriction enzyme uh, cleaves the DNA. Uh, the DNA ligase is going to seal the insulin gene into the plasmid. Um, the host cell takes up that recombinant plasmid DNA. And then uh, you could have uh, gene cloning occurs, and a bacteria uh, is going to produce a product there. So here you can see the gene cloning, and then over here you can see the bacteria producing the product. So gene cloning and bacteria producing the product. And the product in this case is insulin. So we could see uh, how insulin is made there. DNA cloning itself, uh, restriction enzymes cut DNA at specific points. Um, it cleaves vector or plasmid and foreign human DNA. So um, know some of these terms, the vector and the plasmid and the foreign DNA. Um, cleaving, cleaving DNA uh, is going to make DNA fragments ending short, uh, single stranded segments that are going to be called sticky ends. Um, the sticky ends are going to allow for the insertion of foreign DNA into that vector DNA. So you can see the restriction enzyme is going to cut right through here. And you get that TTAA and the AATT sticky ends on these DNA molecules. So this will allow for the binding of that foreign DNA into the, the plasmid there. They are called restriction enzymes. Um, basically because they restrict the growth of the virus. Um, scientists take advantage of these of the enzymes and use them as uh, what we call molecular scissors. So they kind of will cut up the DNA molecularly. Um, DNA ligase itself is then going to come in. It seals that foreign gene into the vector DNA. Um, and the recombinant DNA molecule will then have been prepared. Um, treated cells, like bacteria, will take up those plasmids. Um, bacteria and plasmids uh, reproduce. Uh, many co copies of the plasmid and many copies of the foreign gene will be made. Ult ultimately, then, what you'll end up with is that, that end product there, <clears throat> which in, this, in the book, it highlights the making of um, insulin which regulates, helps to regulate uh, blood sugar. The other thing is the polymerase chain reaction, also known as PCR. Um, a PCR machine, uh, a little device, very uh, mm, kind of medium-sized, uh, but smaller than what you, you're probably used to when you're thinking about the cap with the capabilities of this machine. Um, basically what it does is it's going to amplify or copy targeted sequences of DNA. 
um, very pricey machine. Um, so it amplifies or copies uh, these targeted sequences of DNA. This was <clears throat> um, introduced into science by the American biochemist Kerry Mollis in 1983. He did end up receiving a Nobel Prize for it um, later on. But uh, if you look there, uh, basically what is required for PCR, um, it requires DNA polymerase. Now you know what that enzyme does. Um, withstands the temperature necessary to separate double-stranded DNA. And a supply of nucleotides for the new complementary strand. Um, the amount of DNA doubles with each replication cycle. <clears throat> So polymerase chain reaction, let me just quick jump one thing. So the polymerase chain reaction, here's what happens um, inside uh, that particular, um, in the little machine. So uh, the polymerase chain reaction, uh, basically DNA polymerase is used in the reaction. It's, it's that heat stable enzyme um, that is extracted from a bacterium called Thermus aquaticus. Um, and, and if you look at that name, um, it would tell you why it's able to um, survive with, with these temperatures. Um, because this is a bacteria thermus, like he aquaticus is in a wet environment. Um, it actually is found in, in hot springs. So the enzyme can withstand high temperatures and be used to separate that double strand DNA molecule. So we put in that DNA strand and the DNA segment um, to be amplified um, into the machine. And you, so you put it in this like little tube. And basically what will happen then is um, the sample is first heated to denature the DNA. Um, the DNA is de denatured into single strands. <clears throat> and then what will happen is um, the DNA is cooled to a lower temperature um, to allow for annealing of primers. Um, primers are going to adhere to those parental strands of DNA, and then the DNA is going to be heated to 72 degrees Celsius, um, which is the optimal temperature for TAC DNA. Um, so that TAC DNA uh, polymerase basically is going to go through to extend um, the primers there. So it will go through and add those new nucleotide bases. Um, TAC polymerase is that DNA that has been derived from the Thermus aquaticus bacterium. And then basically what will happen is that would be one cycle. And then cycle two, you get four copies of the DNA. Cycle three, you get eight copies of the DNA. And so, so on and so forth. So you could produce or amplify um, a lot of DNA, make many copies of it for how many cycles you'd ever want to, uh, to do, for how much DNA you ever need. And then what can we use with that? Well, DNA cloning um, applications of PCR um, are able for analyzing of DNA segments. Um, we call these short tandem segments or repeat segments. Um, short tandem repeat profiling is a technique used to analyze DNA fragment links. Um, basically, what you have is a unique collection of different fragments that are produced. Um, gel electrophoresis is a process that can separate the fragments according to their charge or size. Um, we could look at uh, gel electrophoresis. Um, in gel electrophoresis, the gel itself um, will produce these different bands of, of segmented DNA. Gel electrophoresis is very common. Um, in using uh, biotechnology to identify, uh, for instance, uh, the father of a child when you know the mother's DNA and the child's DNA. Uh, another example there, uh, it produces a distinctive pattern called the DNA fingerprint or also DNA uh, profiling. Um, DNA fingerprinting um, is a technology that can identify and distinguish among individuals based on variations in their DNA. Like human fingerprinting, um, the DNA of the individual is different and can be used for identification. So 
I would say within the past two decades, the technique of DNA fingerprinting has become automated and is now done using PCR, which amplifies those short tandem repeat sequences. And there you can see uh, why um, something like this is very beneficial. So it's used in paternity uh, suits, rape cases, corpse identification, etc. So here you can see DNA fingerprinting using those short tandem uh, repeat sequences um, for the profiling to establish paternity. So who is the father of that particular child? And if you were to look, um, there's the child's DNA, here's the mother's DNA, and basically where it would fall into play here, um, you would see most likely that male one would be the father. All right, so what does all this do then? It brings us to 4.2, which is looking at um, how we could use this type of technology to benefit us. So the products of biotech. Um, basically, genetically engineered organisms or transgenic organisms uh, basically is, is essentially what that is. Um, GMOs or genetically modified organisms or GMFs, genetically modified foods. You hear about that a lot in the news. You see them in the grocery stores. Um, now you can understand what they truly are. They are organisms that have had foreign gene inserted into them, making them a transgenic organism. And transgenic is, is the uh, basis for all genetically engineered organisms. So we could have transgenic bacteria. A gene that of in interest is inserted into the bacteria. Bacteria are grown in large vats called bioreactors and the gene product is then harvested. Um, products on the market include insulin, hepatitis B, vaccine, uh, the, the TPA, uh, HDH, which is the human growth hormone. So there are many things there that we could use for uh, biotechnology. Um, transgenic bacteria. Uh, basically what we can do then is use transgenic bacteria um, to produce chemical products, um, transgenic bacteria can promote plant health. Um, for example, if you take that uh, transgenic organism, insert it into strawberries, uh, that the strawberries then would be, um, if the, the gene there was a gene to resist uh, frost, um, those strawberries then would be frost resistant. Um, you've also seen it um, in some organisms. You'd put it in there to basically not allow for a particular fungus to grow on a plant, which would destroy crops. So in agriculture, um, this is very beneficial. Uh, another process would be bioremediation. Um, bioremediation is the process that uses transgenic microorganisms or other microorganisms such as plants to detoxify and degrade environmental pollutants. Um, we have seen this used in the uh, deep water horizon spill in the Gulf of Mexico, as well as other major oil spills in our, in our oceans. But basically, uh, that would be something that you're familiar with. If you recall the uh, down in the Gulf of Mexico, New Orleans, all the oil washed up on the Gulf Coast beaches, um, uh, this was a, a product of, of BP, uh, British Petroleum. Basically, uh, what happened there is one of their deep water um, oil pipes burst and dumped gallons and gallons, thousands and gallons of oil into the, the Gulf of Mexico there. So one of the ways they have cleaned up uh, some of that oil is through bioremediation. Um, basically, they had oil-eating bacteria, so they used transgenically or modified bacteria that were able to eat the oil. Um, so oil-eating bacteria was used uh, to clean up the beaches. Um, one stream was given, given those genes to clean up the toxins 
and a suicide gene to self-destruct after the, after the job was complete. So those bacteria won't remain in the environment. <clears throat> So here you can see um, a picture of a, a biologist there. He is making um, a bacteria for bioremediation. Biotechnology products, uh, genetically modified plants, um, foreign genes can be inserted or introduced into those plants. Um, you can introduce them to immature plant embryos or plant cells called protoplasts and protoplasts that have had the cell wall removed. So what is the purpose of these? Um, I've, I have seen uh, transgenic tobacco plants. Um, basically, they have been inserted with the P-Glow gene, and they are able to glow. Um, agricultural crops, uh, foreign genes, now give cotton, corn, and potato strains the ability to produce an insect toxin. So uh, they self-produce uh, insecticide. Um, some of that is called the BT toxin. Um, you've probably heard of that as well. Um, soybeans are now resistant to a common herbicide. So you can see the, the, the vast amounts of things that we could do uh, in the agricultural industry with um, biotechnology. Um, if you're ever driving on the highway and you're looking, you're driving past a soybean field or a corn field, or any type of, of farm field that is using um, transgenic or genetically modified plants, often what you'll see is the company's name, and then you'll see uh, a little serial number. Um, they, they should be displaying those uh, if they use that particular seed um, from a company. So you might see something like agro, and it would be a cornfield, and you'll see like a little sign that says agro, and then underneath it will be the serial number, like 112346. Um, that would be uh, that particular genetically modified um, plant's serial number and the company from which it came from. Um, the other thing, uh, it's applicable to human hormones. Um, plants are being engineered to produce human proteins, including hormones, clotting factors, and antibodies in their seeds. So you can see how some of this can benefit us as well. Um, basically, the genes can be inserted into the eggs of animals by microinjection. Um, then you use this thing called vortex mixing. Um, the eggs are placed in an agitator with the DNA and uh, silicon carbide needles. Um, basically, the needles are going to make a tiny hole through which the DNA can be entered. Um, the fertile egg will develop into a transgenic animal. Um, this process has been used to introduce the gene for the bovine growth hormone, or BGH, into the eggs for the purpose of producing larger fishes, cows, pigs, rabbits, and, and sheep. Um, transgenic animals are also used in a thing called gene farming. Um, it is the use of transgenic farm animals to produce pharmaceuticals. Um, genes coding for therapeutic and diagnostic proteins are incorporated into animals' DNA. Um, the proteins appear in the animal's milk. Um, plans are to produce drugs to treat cystic fibrosis, cancer, um, blood diseases, etc. So when we look at this, um, the product of basically using transgenic mammal products, um, you take that human gene for, for the growth hormone, for example, that HDH, and you take the, the donor egg, and you're gonna, going to inject that DNA into the donor egg, and then put it inside a host, and allow for it to develop um, into uh, the product, um, basically, which would be uh, a transgenic organism that is able to produce that human growth hormone um, that would be secreted in the milk. Um, what you could then do is 
Um, you could take that transgenic, the transgenic cells with the gene for human growth hormone and insert it using microinjection into other donor eggs and basically uh, create these transgenic organisms that will keep producing these things. So applications of transgenic animals. Um, basically, a section of DNA called the SRY, which is the sex determining region of the Y chromosome, um, produces a male animal. Um, the SRY gene was cloned and a copy injected into a single celled mouse embryos, which only produce male embryos. Um, a knockout mouse has both alleles of a gene removed or made non functional. Um, so scientists made a knockout mouse with the CTFR um, gene, and that gene is uh, the mutated in cystic fibrosis. Um, the mutant mouse can be used to test new drug treatments for uh, cystic fibrosis research. There is a, a facility uh, where I taught up in Maine. Uh, I taught up in Seal Harbor. It's right on Mount Desert Island. Um, a little bit south of Bar Harbor, there's a facility up there called the Jackson Laboratory. And the Jackson Laboratory does a lot of this stuff um, with uh, genetic research. Um, a fascinating place. They do offer uh, internship opportunities uh, for students, um, especially at the, the college level, undergrad and graduate level. Um, so if you are interested in these fields, and this would be something that you would want to do, uh, as a career, um, that would be a place to, that would be very beneficial to get into um, for some type of research experience. So here you can see the uh, transgenic mammal um, produced. Uh, this is actually using the goat, um, human goat, uh, and a human, uh, yeah, human goat. Uh, the, the egg is coming from a goat, and you're looking at the injection of the human growth hormone. Um, here you can see the differences in the experimental uses of mice. And we will end there for today. Um, we'll look at 14.3 gene therapy. And we'll look at, uh, actually, I think maybe um, we could, because I don't think there's much more. Uh, what is gene therapy? Uh, gene therapy uh, involves procedures to give patients healthy genes to make up for faulty genes. Um, it includes the use of genes to treat genetic disorders and various human illnesses. Um, there are those that are ex vivo, outside the body, or in vivo inside the body methods of gene therapy. Um, ex vivo gene therapy, basically, so now you're looking at outside the body. Um, children with severe combined immunodeficiency or SCID lack the enzyme adenosine deaminase, ADA. Um, bone marrow stem cells are infected with a virus carrying a normal gene for the ADA enzyme and one of the earliest uses of ex vivo was for familial hypercholesterolemia. Cholesterolemia. Um, basically, in vivo or inside the body, we see this type of gene therapy used for cystic fibrosis, um, in nasal respiratory sprays, uh, liposomes, uh, lentroviral vectors, and current research involves the insertion of the p53 tumor suppressor gene into cancer cells to make the tumors responsive to uh, chemotherapy treatment. So here's a whole list of different types of gene therapy. Um, this is in your textbook. Um, check it out. It's pretty interesting. Um, you could see the in vivo and ex vivo. So what each one would do there. The next section, genomics. Um, it's our last section of the book. Um, genomics itself is the study of the genomes of humans and other organisms. So all the genes found within that particular organism. When I was taking genetics back as an undergrad student at Quitstown, um, we were saying that there were 35,000 some genes. Our professor was talking about it. We were learning it. And 
in a matter of one day, um, we walked in the class. It was a Tuesday, Thursday class. So on Tuesday, it was like there are 35,000 genes in the human genome. And by Thursday of us walking back in the class, that number had changed. Um, they came out with the, the number. So uh, sequencing gena, genome, um, basically the Human Genome Project, or HGP, um, produced a working draft of all the pairs and all chromosomes. It took 13 years to sequence 3 billion bases um, along with the length of the chromosomes. Uh, the project involved universities and private labs throughout the world. So this is a collaborator, co collaborative project um, where you had many different institutions and industry working on sequencing the human genome. Um, basically, what is a genome? A genome is all the genetic information of an individual or a species. And the goals of the Human Genome Project were to determine the base pair sequence, construct a map showing the sequences of genes on specific chromosomes, so you can look at the gene loci. Ultimately, what did we find then? When we walked in on class on that Thursday, um, human must have between about 21,000 to 23,000 genes. Um, most code for proteins, and we saw that, uh, you understand that a little bit more in gene expression. Um, gene expression is what controls gene expression. 95% of the average protein coding gene in humans is introns. Uh, much of the human genome, formerly described as that junk DNA, um, we now know has a little bit more purpose to it. Um, basically, what we describe it as junk, uh, it does not specify the order of amino acids in that polypeptide chain. Um, RNA molecules can have a regulatory effect in cells. Um, you also get this thing called polymorphisms that were identified. Um, most polymorphisms vary by only one nucleotide. Um, certain SNPs or single nucleotide polymorphisms uh, may change an in individual susceptibility um, to disease or response to treatment. So structural genomics, knowing the base sequence, is being followed by functional genomics. The structure of eukaryotic genomes. Uh, historically, genes are identified as discrete units of heredity that correspond to a locus on a chromosome. Um, prokaryotes typically possess a single circular chromosome. The eukaryotic chromosomes are much more complex. The genes are distributed along the length of a chromosome and the genes are fragmented into exons. So here you can see the uh, chromosomal DNA. Um, there you can see gene A with the exons and the introns. Um, Pre-messenger RNA, so that pre mnr transcript um, when they're removed. Uh, the RNA introns are removed, and what you get is that particular messenger RNA. So you could see gene A and gene B with its poly A tail and its 5' prime cap. So the eukaryotic gene structure. Um, intergenic sequences are those DNA sequences that occur between genes. So intergenic sequences are DNA sequences that occur between genes. And repetitive DNA elements occur when the same sequence of two or more nucleotides is repeated many times along the length of one or more chromosomes. Um, this is basically interspersed repeats. A uh, type of repetitive DNA element are thought to play a role in the evolution of new genes. And then there was this thing that you've heard of before called transposons. Um, these are specific DNA sequences that have uh, the remarkable ability to move within and between chromosomes. Um, unique non-coding DNA, uh, the majority of intergenic sequences uh, would fall into that category. So here you can see, um, interpreting the graph on the y-axis, you have the percentage in the human genome. And on the x-axis, you have exons, introns, uh, repetitive DNA, and unique uh, DNA. So you have your coding versus your non-coding DNA and the categories of DNA sequences. So um, you can see that the coding DNA itself is 2%. You have 59% that are repetitive, 24% introns, and 15% is unique DNA. 
Transposons are specific DNA sequences that have the remarkable ability to move within and between uh, chromosomes. Uh, basically what they can do is they can act as regulator genes. Uh, we, we looked at that in the last chapter. The movement of transposons throughout the genome is thought to be a driving force in evolution, which is our next unit. Um, the ALU repetitive element would be an example of that. Uh, here's the lovely lady that discovered uh, transposons, or what she termed jumping genes. Her name is Barbara McClintock. Um, Barbara McClintock uh, was working with Indian corn, and what she realized is jumping genes um, were first identified in this Indian corn, and she wasn't given much credit at first, but, uh, like many. Um, she was a brilliant lady. Um, but then later on, uh, uh, she was taken more seriously with her research. So they have since uh, been discovered in both flies, bacteria, and in humans as well. So there you can see the normal gene. There's the transposon. I'm looking at the Indian corn. So the normal gene codes for purple pigment. Um, the transposon cannot code for purple pigments. So you get the different colorations there. So if we revise the definition of a gene then, based on genomics, um, the new definition of the gene should remove the emphasis from the chromosome and place it on the result of transcription. So the central dogma of genetics has to be expanded. Um, a gene product need not be a protein. RNAs are also useful products. Um, a gene need not to be on one locus on a chromosome and any DNA sequence can result in one or more products. Um, we've learned that within gene expression. So you could have a certain gene, DNA gene expression or gene that can code for more than one type of protein. So in other words, the genetic material need not be DNA. Um, it could include all these. So the functional genome would basically aim to understand the role of the genome in the cell and the organism. Um, we could use DNA microarrays. Um, basically, DNA microarrays can monitor the expression of thousands of genes simultaneously and tell us what genes are turned off and the environmental conditions that turn on the gene. Um, that is pretty cool when you're thinking about uh, epigenetic factors, when you're going beyond the gene there to see how those genes are turned off and what turns them on and how the external influences of that gene, for example, UV radiation, chemical exposure, um, so on and so forth, would affect the expression of that particular gene. DNA microarrays contain microscopic amounts of DNA fixed onto a single glass slide or silicon chip in known locations. Um, messenger RNAs bind through the DNA sequences on the chip through complementary base pairing. Um, this allows for the identification of genes that are active in the cell. Um, it can be used to identify various mutations in the genome of an individual. This is called a person's genetic profile. And the genetic profile may indicate if any genetic illnesses are likely and what type of gene therapy might be most appropriate um, to prevent or cure that particular genetic illness. Comparative genomics um, compares the human genome to the genomes of other organisms. Um, model organisms have genetic mechanisms or, and cellular pathways that are common to ours. Um, scientists inserted the human gene associated with early onset of Parkinson's disease and the Drosophila melanogaster, which is the fruit fly. And the flies showed symptoms similar to humans with the disorder. Um, this shows that flies might be used instead of mice to study therapies for early onset of Parkinson's. Um, comparative genomics offers a way to study changes in the genome over time. And here you can see a comparison of sequenced genomes. So estimated size. Um, for us, we have about uh, 3.2 million bases an estimated about 25,000 genes on 46 chromosomes. Uh, you could see the uh, roundworm 
uh, roundworms are, are model organisms as well. They have 97 million bases on about 19,000 genes, which are found on 12 chromosomes. Um, Saccharomyces cerevisiae is uh, yeast, 12 million bases, 6,300 genes found on 32 chromosomes. And there, of course, is our friend, the fruit fly. Here you can see uh, an example of what that DNA microarray technology would look like. Um, the DNA probe array, um, the tagged DNA, the DNA probe, um, basically testing subjects DNA. So the tagged DNA did not bind to the probe in the areas where you see black indicated there. Finishing up, uh, proteomics. Proteo proteomics is the study of the structure, function, and interaction of cellular proteins. So if we look at this, the entire collection of a species, proteins, is its proteome. Um, the proteome is larger than the genome. Think of all the proteins out there. Um, so basically mechanisms such as alternative uh, re-messenger RNA, splicing increases the number of possible proteins that are there. Understanding protein function is essential to the development of better drugs. Um, correlate drug treatment to the particular genome, and it's going to increase the efficiency and decrease side effects. Uh, once the primary structure of a protein is known, it should be possible to predict its tertiary structure and basically computer modeling of the tertiary structure of proteins is an important part of proteomics. This would then lead us into bioinformatics, uh, uh, a growing field in biology is the application of computer technology, software, and statistical data to study biological information. Um, genomics and proteomics uh, produce raw data. Um, these fields depend on computer analysis to find significant patterns in the data itself. Um, scientists hope to find relationships between genetic profiles and genetic disorders. There's this thing called BLAST and BLAST searches to identify homologous genes in model organisms. Homologous genes are genes that code for the same proteins. Basically, new computational tools will be needed to accomplish these goals. And here you can see a, a facility that is doing such, um, collecting such data. So that's it. Uh, it's a 40 some minute lecture. I know it was pretty long, but I hope you enjoyed it. Um, it's quite fascinating. Um, we will look at some of these topics in class, um, go over them, do a couple of activities related to this. Um, but this did take out the whole chapter in one lecture, which you already had predetermined. So I thank you very much, AP Biology students, and have a nice day.